Step Change in Safety is committed to raising and promoting awareness of mental health among the energy industry workforce, both onshore and offshore. We recognise the increasing level of mental health challenges our workforce is facing. We also know that this can pose major risks to safety and well-being. Mental health is about how we think, feel and behave. It is easy to conclude that an individual is either mentally healthy or mentally ill. In reality, it isn't as straightforward as that. Your mental health is not static. It is much better viewed as a continuum, which ranges from excellent mental health at one extreme to crisis point at the other extreme. Your position on the continuum will change based on a variety of influences and circumstances. Some days, you may feel like you're thriving or even excelling. On other days, you may feel you're just getting by or struggling or even reaching crisis point. It's okay not to be in the thriving and excelling zones all the time. Life will throw its challenges at you. The important part is to recognise where you are and then to be able to steer yourself away from the struggling, crisis direction of the continuum. In support of Step Change and Safety, some very courageous individuals connected to our industry have volunteered to share their mental health experiences. These short videos cover a variety of topics including depression, anxiety and post-traumatic stress disorder. These personal experiences highlight signs and symptoms that I'm sure we can all recognise to a degree. They also illustrate some real-life examples of what can trigger a change in mental health and move someone along the continuum. They cover important coping strategies and how these are adapted over time, including the importance of speaking to someone about how you're feeling and not keeping it all to yourself. Most importantly, these videos give hope that you can come back from a real crisis or from struggling to a better position on the mental health continuum. I'd like to thank all of the contributors for having the courage to share their stories. In addition to helping reduce the stigma attached to mental health issues, they've also been motivated by the opportunity to help others learn from their experiences. In the following film, we hear from Gina Mooney about her experience of bereavement following the sudden death of her husband, Eamon, whilst he was working offshore in 2012. She will describe really powerfully how this impacted her mental health and how she managed to cope over the years, evolving her coping strategies to allow her to maintain her mental health today. I'm Gina Mooney. I'm from Aberdeen. At the tail end of 2012, I lost my husband, Eamon. He died suddenly offshore. Uh, fit and healthy guy. Uh, no health problems as far as we were aware. And we just came back from a three-week holiday in Florida. So as Eamon said that week, life just doesn't get any better than this. Um, we'd just been away celebrating my son's 10th birthday and uh, had a fantastic holiday and he was all set to go offshore. Um, he left for a 6am check-in, as is the norm, and unfortunately he, I didn't get the chance to say goodbye to him that day because I thought I'll be speaking to you later on. Um, he called later that afternoon. Um, he was the only person on the chopper and uh, the pilot had said to him, oh, are you related to Prince Charles or something? Um, so he was in great spirits and uh, I said to him I'd speak to him later. I happened to be out at tea time and missed his call, so just thought I'll get to speak to him tomorrow instead and didn't get a chance to say goodbye to the children either. Um, and uh, that night, while I was in bed, there was a knock on the door and uh, when I came down, there was two people and I just didn't want to answer the door and then they showed me a police badge and um, now, <laughs> stupid, but I still think back, if only I hadn't answered that door, I wouldn't have heard the news. 
Um, it's a bit of a blur, but they came in and told me that he'd been working offshore and had um, collapsed and died and couldn't be revived. Um, to be honest, I can't really remember much of the conversation. I knew that at some point I must have phoned my mum and my sister. Um, I just remember being on my knees and um, hearing the news and they kept asking all these questions from his childhood and they stayed for hours and I'm thinking, oh, please just stop these questions. There is just a huge sense of disbelief. I, I don't even really remember how I felt, but just that it couldn't be happening. Um, what could I do? And it sounds so silly, but, you know, what should I have done? Why did, you know, why did I even answer the door? Or if only I had spoken to him, if I had been in for his call, could I have told him not to work too hard? Or what was he doing? I, I didn't know anybody offshore. I didn't know where it happened, who he was with. It was really important for me to know that he hadn't suffered. And because there was that break, I, I, I didn't even know the guys he worked with. I didn't have that sense of... Just, I just felt powerless and I should have been there to help him. So I waited up until the children were getting up for school in the morning and I asked them to come through to the bedroom and my mum and my sister were there. And my daughter came through and I hugged her and my son just waited at the door and said, it's my dad, what's happened to my dad? And I said, come here. And um, I just hugged him. And I said that your dad, oh, I think I said, I knew I had only one chance to ever say this and I wanted to kind of get it right, I don't know. And I, uh, I hugged him and I just said, your dad was working today and his heart just started beating really fast and it just stopped and he fell asleep and he just didn't wake up again and they they just started crying. Pretty soon I, 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 ju I just decided there and then that my kids are not going to suffer. I had an uncle that died very young and it was amazing how quickly it came back to what these kids went through and so that first day I had a purpose. I felt so helpless with what happened with Eamon, but I had this purpose that my kids are going to be okay. And then it stopped me thinking about myself. Um, I thought I was fine. I thought I was normal until uh, I was asked to come into the doctor um, within a couple of days. And I said, what am I doing here? There's nothing wrong with me. It's, it's actually my husband that's died. There's absolutely nothing wrong with me. And then they took my blood pressure and it was like 200 and something. And uh, when she covered it up and she was like, would you mind just taking uh, tablets? And I says, no, there's nothing wrong with me. Um, and then she says, and to be honest, that's, that's what got me through to the funeral. I think I said so many times I'm fine that I actually believed it. And I, I still believe that I'm a strong person. And in the annual service of remembrance um, held at uh, St Nicholas, I, I met um, some people who'd been in the Super Puma crash. And a guy was telling me how he, he couldn't sleep at night and various things that happened. And I thought, oh, that, that happens to me. And I, I didn't even join the dots. And, you know, it might sound such a simple thing, but the lack of sleep and the tiredness really did affect me and now I, f I feel if I can be organised, um, small things like getting a good night's sleep or feeling organised in my house and um, that, that does help because it can sometimes be the smallest of triggers that maybe upset you like things breaking in the house and suddenly I realise there was no one there to fix them or um, an anniversary coming up or an event. My, my son, had, I was trying to decide on which secondary school to put him to and I got really upset because I had no one there to ask. And sometimes I feel what works for me is I get my head around something first and then when I have my head around it, then I can speak to somebody else. And 
And even though I don't, and I think I don't need anybody, I always feel better when I maybe open up to a friend. I've got a couple of friends I open up to about anything, um, and, and and that really helps. So in the initial stages, um, people didn't realise, but what I found was my way of coping was just to block everything out. Um, I was used to aiming working offshore uh, for a two on, three off. So what I did every day was just pretend he was offshore. I didn't tell people that because they'd think I was crazy, but I used to think uh, he's offshore and I'll just get by today or this week and that helped. Um, if I thought about the future, that scared me, so I stopped doing that. Um, I also had a purpose. I had given myself a purpose, and that was to give my kids the best possible life they could have, to be mum and dad. Um, sometimes a bit run ragged, but I, I kind of felt I'd ticked that box, and that was the only thing I thought, what can I do for Eamon? I wasn't able to help him. So if I could be a great mum and give his kids a great life, so that, that was great um, in the early stages as well. So, so coping wise, I still adopt the same mantra. I, uh, I, I revolve my life around the kids, and people who know me in latter years probably just look and think you, you've got two spoiled kids. But no, they they are my purpose in life, and um, unfortunately, some months after Eamon passed away, I thought I I can get on with this, and I found out that it was a genetic condition. And that raised a whole lot of, of triggers. Uh, then it was my first time I felt a little bit angry. And I thought, no, I've, I've, already, I've already coped with this. Don't give me something else to cope with. Um, in that instance, Google is not a, your friend. Don't go down the Google route. Um, but I just said, you know, this is not going to rule my life. We're going to have a great life um, by hook or by crook. Yeah, I, I had a lot of people that would say, how are you? And I knew that I had to say I'm fine to them because that's what they wanted to hear. And if I didn't say that, they would feel uncomfortable. And if I had said, and, and even people who avoid you. So my advice would be to anyone, if you know of someone who's lost a person close to them, don't worry about upsetting them. You, you must acknowledge that because people ignoring it is probably the most hurtful thing that can happen. So regardless if you bring a tear to their eye, you know, ask that question, speak about the person. And uh, so, so I had to kind of do the, yes, I'm fine to 90% of people or 95% of people. But my close friends, I could have a little rant. I could moan about things. I could... You know, I, I could have a laugh about my husband. You know, suddenly I, m I remember uh, Gordon Craig saying to me, you know, everybody will speak about him as if he's a saint. Um, but yeah, you know, I, I rem remember opening one of my cards from my friend and said, uh, we're not going to have to listen to him uh, murdering songs anymore. And, and I loved it. I remember that card more than most others. But it's nice to have people who you could just be the old Gina as opposed to being some widow or that poor lassie that lost her husband. You could just be that crazy one that liked to wine, you know. Um, I was invited here, and I feel very honoured to be invited here, by uh, Gordon Craig, uh, the oil and gas chaplain. Um, I've never spoken in public before about my situation. I've always felt it's a little bit self-indulgent, but... Um, and, and really, I know that it's not, um, that I, I would I would like to give a little bit, if, if I think I, my words can help someone else, I would be delighted. Well, oh my goodness, you have just heard a very thought-provoking and powerful account of how one person, someone just like you and me, has overcome some huge issues in their lives and come out the other side. A few themes resonate very strongly throughout. Firstly, we need to have purpose and structure to allow us to understand how life events can impact our position on the mental health continuum, especially when going through the grieving and loss process. 
We need people to be willing to help and understand the good and the bad days. We need to be allowed to be our real selves. Also, we need to understand that it's okay not to be okay. And it's also okay to say that we need help. And there are many organisations out there who can offer that help, not least of which is our own oil and gas chaplaincy. These organisations can help us to work our way back towards the more positive end of the mental health continuum. When grieving, there is a huge range of emotional, physical, psychological and behavioural signs of grief, all of which can be very normal. The fact that we are all listening to this heartfelt account of such traumatic experiences and we are discussing them in open forum, as well as actually doing this without fear of reprisal or even ridicule, is testament to the enormous amount of work by many people to reduce the terrible stigma of mental ill health. My hope, along with so many others, is that we can continue to grow and learn from these accounts of various traumas and keep breaking down those barriers that stop people from living their life to the fullest. The Step Change in Safety Mental Health Awareness Pack comprises this series of short films, a quick start guide and a guidance document and it has been created to raise awareness and initiate discussion. However, there are many available sources of mental health support and information and if you require immediate help, please, for example, contact your own GP, the oil and gas chaplaincy, occupational health providers, your private health insurance or the Samaritans or even go to the Step Change website for some help and advice. These are just a few of the many options available to you out there. However, whatever you do, please don't let it fester. Please talk about it.